Let us remain standing now as we bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we are just only believing. You have told us just to believe, and we believe now. And we give thee thanks and praise for what we have already heard and seen. Good bankers are faith. Now we thank thee for another opportunity to come to minister to those who are needy. Now I pray thee, God, to meet our needs tonight according to thy promise. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We are very happy tonight for this uh, privilege of coming back to the tabernacle again to, to, with the gospel of the risen Lord Jesus. Uh, and uh, just a little late, I had a special rushing case from Michigan just now, and the Lord done a marvelous thing just now. Uh, he knows everything and lays it just. Uh, you don't have to tell him, he knows. He knows just what he and so we're very grateful that people drove all day to get here. And then we're so thankful for that. Now, don't forget the... This tape's on. That's the lights. Oh, the lights are icy. Um, don't forget the, the services um, this coming week, uh, Wednesday night and next Sunday morning and Sunday night. If you're around in the neighborhood, I know they'll sure be glad to have you here. Amen. And now... Pray for me as I go on my road elsewhere, and I hope to be back again soon. I want to thank you all for your kindness and for memories of what you have done for me. Uh, brother just sent me a new suit of clothes from down a little church in Georgia, and, and uh, uh, people—it's uh, just marvelous. And I want to thank those people from down in Kentucky that I was with last week on the vacation, and all that the Lord did for us there great mighty hand that we've seen him what he did now we're trusting to see you again pretty soon as soon as i get back this way going to new york uh, for the meeting that's at the stone church with brother big uh, beginning i believe it's november the 12th we'll be by here a few days before the time and then we pass back to you again going to to down to um shreveport louisiana with brother jack moore that's a thanksgiving thanksgiving week to be there at Shreveport. It's on the bulletin board, I think, back there in the announcements. And then we hope to be with some of the Southern friends after Christmas. We'll be in Phoenix in January. <clears throat> and then waiting for the overseas call so we can get the meetings ready for overseas. They're working on them now. This last month, Brother Borders, corresponding back and forth from a complete world tour to begin just as soon as we get it ready. But we have to wait for conditions. The crowds are so tremendous there, we can't put them in buildings. You just have to set them out on the ground. And then sometimes they run up, it's almost unbelievable to the numbers, sometimes as much as 500,000. That's a half a million people in one single gathering. Not how many attends a meeting in so many days, but one gathering. You know, usually evangelist counts how many people attended in six weeks, you see. But we, we count just how many is there that day, that one time. And so uh, sometimes there's no place to seat them. You always have to put them out on the ground. And uh, we have to get the seasons where it's not raining and pouring down rain. And those poor people sat out there. I've seen women sat out there with their hair just stringing down, fine dressed people, and just, just sitting that rain all day long. Just sat there and it is pouring and thundering, lightning and storms blowing them, just weaving back and forth against one another like that. Sitting right there, wait till you come to pray for them. Now, you know God honors faith like that. You know, you've got to do something for God to honor, you see. You show him, uh, people has got everything handed to them so easy, they don't usually, they, they don't do nothing for it, you see. You've got to, the gift is free, that is true. But you, you've got to, it seems like it, you know, like to say, if you're born with a silver spoon, you've heard that, you don't appreciate. But when you have to work for it, you appreciate the valuation of it. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> you uh, people in the tapes in there, uh, I would that, uh, that I think now, uh, this morning, the message this morning was to me the highlights message of my entire ministry. This morning, see, a highlight message of my entire ministry. Someday I'll tell you how it come about. 
And I know that everything has worked for months and months and months up to that one message. Moving up to come to that place, that was a capping off time of it. Just. And um, that's, uh, now I'm sure, I hope that you've got the, what the token meant. See, the token is the sign that the blood has been applied, that the price that's been asked, required of God, Jesus paid that price by shedding his own blood. He did that. Then from his life came the Holy Spirit, and when the blood is applied to you, the Holy Spirit is a token that your price is paid. Amen. God has received you. Amen. And that's the token. Remember, that is the token. Now, there's many people who doesn't, they, they don't know what that token is, see. And you have to make it like it nobody knows, see, so that the, all of them will get it. Just like preaching salvation. We have to preach salvation in a way that everybody is for everybody, which we know it isn't. We have to preach divine healing for everybody, yet we know it isn't, see. Jesus come to save those who was in the book of redemption before the foundation of the world. He only come to save those who they are, I don't know. See? But you, nobody can have faith unless you say it's for whosoever, and it is. Nobody can come unless God's called them. That is true. So there's many people that won't be saved. We know that. They, well, God knew that before the world began, that they wouldn't be saved. There's many that won't be healed. See? Many won't be healed. They just can't, they can't grasp it. They don't know what it is. Many will be. But we preach it that it's for everybody because we don't know who that person is. We just don't know. But that is a whosoever. But some people just can't grasp that faith. Now, and same thing about this token. The token, we have talked to the token all the way along. But now is the manifestation of the token. See? Now, we have sometimes allowed it, the Lutherans allowed it to accepting the Word, accepting Christ as personal Savior. The Methodist said, when you get happy enough to shout, that's it. The Pentecostal says, speak in tongues, and you got it. And we find out that all of it was wrong. Amen. The token is the token. It's you and Christ as persons together. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit. His life in you working His, His own life through you. And it's for the rich, the poor, or for whosoever will receive it. Now remember, the token is what you, you go to the railroad company and you buy your fare. There's a price cost, say, it cost uh, 50 cents to ride this, this bus line or the railroad from here to, to uh, uh, Charleston, Indiana cost 50 cents. Well, now a company puts out tokens <clears throat> so that, see, now the thing you do, you go down and someone purchases your fare, 50 cents. They give you a token that gives you the right on that train. So its destination, wherever that train goes, see, it gives you, that's a token. Now, this case, the blood was a token. Literally, it had to be applied because it's just chemistry is all they had because it was a lamb's blood, an animal, a lamb's blood. So the life that was in the blood, the life that was gone out so the blood was shed, see, the life went out, but it couldn't come back on the believer because it's an animal. Yeah. But it only spoke of a good conscience that there was coming one, a perfect sacrifice. And to make it a perfect one, the whole judge, the God of heaven, become the sacrifice. Amen. Judge, jury, and attorney. Amen. He, he become the sacrifice. And then when his life went out, which was God, and the word there, where it comes, and I'll give unto them eternal life. Now, in the Greek, I know I'm talking to scholars. I see two or three. See? And, I, and the word in the Greek there is zoe. Z-O-E. In the Greek, which means God's own life. And I will give unto him zoe, my own life. Christ and God was one. Then the life that was in Christ is the Holy Ghost, not the third person, but the same person Amen. in the form of the Holy Spirit coming up on you as a token that your life and your affair is paid. Yeah. You have been accepted. 
Until that token comes, you're not permitted on the highway. You're not permitted on the, in the, the bus line. You're not permitted to go in until you can present this token. And that token is your fare. And now it shows that the blood has been shed and been applied to you, the price. It's been applied to you and you have the token that the blood is applied to you and you're accepted. Get it now? Oh my. Oh, not, not, just not, no certain evidence. See? You say, Brother Branham, I feel it in your mind, you see? Why will I know? Look, what were you? And what are you? There's how you know. See? What was you before this token was applied? What are you after it's applied? What was your desires before and what is your desires after? Then you know where the token's applied or not. And these other things just automatically go with that. See? It, it isn't. Like talking about to say tongues is the evidence. Now I bear, buy a pair of shoes. The tongue isn't the shoe. It just comes with the shoe. <laughs> it just comes with the shoe. Now the same thing is uh, the token. The token is Christ. But speaking in tongues and casting out devils and doing those things and preaching and whatever is the evidence. It's there. True. But it's, it's not it. See? It's a gift of it. If I told you that you say, uh, I, I want you, Brother Bram, and I give you a gift. See? Well, that's not me. That's my gift. Tongues is a gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Not the Holy Ghost, a gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the devil can't impersonate any of those things. Amen. But he cannot be the Holy Ghost. Amen. He can impersonate these gifts, but he can't be the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the Holy Ghost is the token that the blood's been applied because it follows the blood all the way from the book of redemption. Amen. Amen. See it? That was the purpose of him coming. That's what he followed in every age. Every age he's followed that to see that's brought forth and they could not be made perfect without us. And now the entire Holy Spirit visits the church making God in human flesh. Amen. As he did before Sodom, the burning there, which was a type. And Abraham, he appeared to him. All the things that he hasn't done down through the ages, in the church ages, he is now doing Back to the word because the messages and the messages and the messages have to wind up in the entire word. And in the last days, the seven seals being opened was to pick up every struggle that's been left off in it and make the whole thing in one great big body of the bride. That them who live back there was not perfect until this church be perfected, this bride group in the last days to bring them in and all together be taken up. See? The token, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is among us. Amen. Amen. We should reverence Thank that. We, 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 we can't humble ourselves enough. Take it off your shoes or getting on your knees wouldn't expel it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't satisfy. It wouldn't suffice us. But a life that brings forth the fruit of the Spirit. Now what is the fruit of the Spirit? See? Love, joy, peace. Remember this morning? Preparation sent the messenger with the message. Next thing he done at you, sent the messenger with the message. He sent the pillar of fire for a vindication. Amen. Next thing was, after that, was uh, a, constella a consolation. See? Uh, you knew that it was right. It was at peace. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, tonight, we're going to pray for the sick. I think they have communion. You don't have that? That is it's communion. communion. And we want you to stay for communion. And within, within 35 or 40 minutes, uh, we aim to be finished and ready for the communion. And now tomorrow is the time of Labor Day, so you can kind of rest up. Now, I said that was our intention, you see. We don't know what I want to be sure to make that right. Now, this morning, I told you, being not with you, I, I think we had another two or three hour message this morning, but... But I, I just got started, and I thought I'd just carry that over for tonight, but it was just too tremendous. I don't know whether the people got it or not. I hope they do everywhere. I hope there was some good tapes on it so it can be carried out 
to be knowing that I believe of all the messages that I ever brought that absolute was ordained of God outside of the course of the regular commission like the seven seals and things. That was directly the word of God. I'm talking about a message to preach. I believe that one was it. See, yeah. uh, the, well, the one is needed to follow those seven seals. Now watch what's come at the seven seals. The uniting of the people. United signs. The red light flashing in the last days. The sign of women getting prettier. And man, what they would do. All these signs of the Holy Spirit leading up. And then come right back here to the capping off of all those messages. Since the seven seals is capped off in this one thing. The token. Amen. That we are all right. See? Just check ourselves and see if we're in the faith. Amen. Now, the Lord bless you. And now, before we... Before we turn over in the Bible to pray for the sick, we asked this morning how many was prayed for last Sunday night that, that, that got healed, was healed already this week. And practically everybody here raised up their hand. That was at the meeting last Sunday night. Now it's something you understand. It's something that's, it's, I'm catching this for myself. There was a little boy that just told, uh, come down from... Uh, Chicago, a little Mrs. Uh, is that Peckman Paul? Pe Miss Peckman Paul from from. Uh, she's a very fine uh, Christian sister, and she brought somebody, uh, a kid, uh, way I understand it, a little boy or something that, that the, the doctors didn't even know what was the matter with him. His lungs were so bad or something that, that they couldn't do could put him in school or something. It's very very bad, and said. The Holy Spirit, right after the message, spoke to that little boy. He called him, told him his conditions and so forth, and pronounced his healing. And this week he went, the mother or parents or whoever it was, taking him back to the doctor, and the doctor said he had a new set of lungs. Amen. New set of lungs. And boy, I understand that the that the parents or somebody called a long distance call or some way, they let it be known to the congregation. See? Now, God the Creator can make a set of them. I, I truly believe that we're on the, the verge of one of the most mightiest things that ever struck here. But now, we can only be known as a, it'll be so humble. See? See what man calls mighty, God calls abomination. But what man calls foolish, God calls mighty. See? So now watch it. See, it'll be so humble that you'll never miss it. You'll miss it if you're not got the token there to examine it. You see, see? who would ever thought that the mountains are skipping like little rams and the leaves are clapping their hands when a prophet came forth from the wilderness? And it spoke about Isaiah 1200 or 712 years before with whiskers all over his face and a piece of sheepskin, not even a pulpit to preach in, excommunicated from all the churches and standing on the bank of the Jordan screaming, repent and call the people a bunch of vipers, snakes. But that's what God said that when he come the mountains and skipped like a little ram, see. The humble saw it and was glad. Amen. How could they understand that a, that great Messiah that was prophesied from the very beginning of the book in Genesis that he would become a savior. All sacrifices and all prophets and everything had pointed to him. And then when he come, supposedly to be an illegitimate birth, a father that was not even married to his mother, supposedly. And the woman was found pregnant with the baby before they was even married. And come up and such and born in a, a little, well, it says a stable in the Bible, but a stable in them days was a cave back in the, uh, back in the wall. I met such a place out in Arizona one time hunting. There's a stable back under a cliff of rocks. And that's the way Jesus was born, back in this little cliff stable. On a manger of hay and straw. In a cow barn, see, where stock was. And was raised up as a carpenter's helper. And how could that be the mighty Jehovah? But it was. Amen. It was. See? Very odd sort of a person. 
But oh, when he's just a boy, he astounded the priest by knowing that word because Amen. of it. Why? He was the word. Amen. He was the word. He never wrote a book. He never wrote a, he never wrote a word. The only word he ever wrote, I guess he raced it out in the, in the sand when a woman had been taken in adultery. Amen. He never wrote a word. Why? He was the word. Amen. He was the word. He didn't have to write it. His life lived it. Amen. He was the word. If, he, if I do not the works of my father, then believe me not. Amen. If I don't do exactly what the word said I would do, then I'm not the word. But if, that's what he meant. He is the word. So now... Prepare yourself now for the, the oncoming healing service and the communion. We'd be happy for you to stay with us. If you can't, if you can't, we'll have a dismissal right away. And don't forget, pray for me and pray for my wife, uh, the sweetest woman in all the world, and, and for my children. And I, I've claimed them, everyone, for the Lord Jesus. Uh, Becky is just at the age of a little... Uh, Rick Etta, you know, just a, a, a little uh, tiny, as we used to call it. And then she's just at that age, but now she's a very sweet girl. I, I thank the Lord for that. No smoking, no drinking, no running around, nothing. But she's just at that age. She, she's carefree. She don't want to go to church. And if she does, she sit back there and choo choo and got to get up and walk out. That's, see, I want to see her filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want to see Joseph. I want that boy, I believe, that someday when I can't. Walk to the pulpit no more. I won't take this old worn out Bible and hand it over to him and say, Joseph, stay with it, son. <laughs> then I'm ready to climb on up. I want to hear a wind blowing somewhere. Look up. Wave my hand. Take off. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, our whole life is wrapped in that. For it's you and you are our life. Now there's some here, Lord, that that even holds this token that I spoke of. They have possessed that token, and yet they're sick. And I want to speak tonight on giving them courage, to, to encourage them to take that God-given rights. They have a right to defeat that devil. He's already defeated, and he's just bluffing them. I'm claiming them, Father. Now help me to speak the word you speak through me, Lord, but this few notes that I got wrote down here and little scriptures wrote out. I pray that you'll help me, Lord, and get in the Word and give them faith for the glory of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now quickly, I want you to turn in the Bible to the book of Jeremiah and the 29th chapter if you like to read or if you don't, just mark it down. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, and we're going to begin with the 10th verse of Jeremiah, the 10th verse of the 29th chapter. Also, we're going to read from Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Now, I'm going to give you my text while you're, you're, you're turning. My text tonight is Desperations. And, uh, Desperation. And now, you know what desperations is? And now we're going to read from Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the 10th verse. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to turn to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Isn't that sweet? Saith the Lord. Though thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you the accepted end. Then shall you call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all nations and from all the places where I have drove you, saith the Lord, and will bring you again unto unto the place which I cause you to be 
carried away captive back to Pentecost. I put that in myself. It doesn't say it. That's what I was meaning to the church. Luke 16. Again, 15th verse. All right, the 16th verse. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. <laughs> every man presses into it. Not just simply walks into it easily, but it's got to be pressed into it. You see? Now, when you seek me with all your heart, then I'll be found. And he promised that he would return and bring the people from scattered all the earth after those seven years back into Jerusalem where they left from. And he did it just that way. That's right. Now, we're going to talk on, on desperations for a few minutes now. Usually, it takes a state of emergency to throw us into desperation. It's too bad it has to do that. But human beings are so slothful in their mind that it takes an emergency. Something arises. And when they do, then it, it throws them into that desperation. And really, in doing that, in desperation, it brings out that real thing that you are. It shows what you're made out of in the time of desperation. It usually pulls out all the good things that's in you. In time of death, I've heard people, when they know they were dying, the things that they kept secret all their life, they, in desperation, they were trying to confess it. See? And trying to take this and make it right. Go, please, go, do. See, in desperation, you ought to have done that before him. See? Not wait till the time of emergency. Will you do so and so for me? The emergency causes desperation when we ought to do it without the emergency. Now, we notice tonight that we're taking the symbols of the Passover. And the Passover was taken in emergency, in times of desperation. You notice in, in uh, Exodus, the 12th chapter, and the 11th verse of the 12th chapter, I believe it is, it says, eat this Passover with the shoes on your feet, with your loins girded up, and with the staff in your hand. See, you're eating in, in desperation. They had seen the great hand of God. They saw all of His miracles. And then they come under the sign of the token. And while they were under the sign of the token, they'd taken the communion in, in desperation. For they knew at that time God was fixing to strike with judgment. And it was a shaking time. It was a time where every man was examining himself. Because the word of the prophet had not failed one time. It had been proven to be true. Whatever he said, it kept him just exactly the way he said it. The pillar of fire was still there. And then the prophet had announced that God would only pass over when he saw the token at the door. And it was a desperation. I'd imagine the children were... When they saw those big black wings drop down from the sky, like a smoke settling over the city, the screams coming from every house, the children might have went to their daddy and said, Daddy, are you sure that we're under that token? And he could go to the door and look upon the post a little and say, Son, that's according to his word. Amen. Remember, I'm your oldest child. Daddy, are you positive? I am positive that's according to what the prophet told us. And he has the word of the Lord. Amen. He said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Take a lamb for the house. I brought all you children in. You're my oldest, but my firstborn. That's the one that's dying all right in there. But there's the blood. That's what thus saith the Lord was. So 
Rest, my son. Rest at ease because God made the promise. See? Well, Daddy, why you got your shoes on? Why you got the staff in your hand? Why have you got a piece of bread in one hand and a lamb in the other hand? Why is that bitter herbs and things? Why are you eating it? What's the sweat running off your face about? Son, this fixing a strike. See, it was in a time of desperation. Now, I believe that we're living in the days that we're, uh, or otherwise the days that we're living in should cause the church to go completely into desperation. I believe since the message this morning from God, not me, I believe that ought to draw this into our congregation into desperation. That we have played long enough. We went to church long enough. We got to do something. How is it that we can see other great signs and wonders done on others than what about us? It's just cause in a state of desperation that we are determined before God. The signs of His coming should bring this entire congregation when we've read it from the Word. And the Holy Spirit has told us, go at a certain place. Such and such a thing will happen. Not tell us what it was, but it would happen. We go there. It happens that way. The newspapers pack it. The magazines pack it. Show the picture of it. Come back here and see those great mysteries hidden in the Bible open up to us on a new field that we never know before. And perfectly blends into the coming of the Lord Jesus. Then at the end of the message, you see the action of the great Holy Spirit. See Him come down visible before people. Even take pictures of it. See it working and showing that it's not a man. It's not just a preacher. It's not a certain congregation. It's the Holy Spirit showing the same thing it did when it was embodied in the body of Jesus Christ. Now it's embodied in the body of His bride. Amen. It should throw us into desperation. Those people had seen the hand of God. And that night of the communion, they took it with the, in desperation. Because they know that something was fixing to happen. And we know something's fixing to happen. Amen. I remember the coming of the Lord will be a sudden secret going away. He'll come and take her like a thief in the night. And to think that if somebody, all of a sudden there's members of our family gone and you're left behind. It should throw us into desperation. That by the grace of God we will not be left back behind. Because any man I don't want, don't be low, leave me, Lord. A few days ago, I was hearing Mel Johnson sing that song, Remember Me When Tears Are Falling Down. Yes, Remember me when friends are not around. When I cross over this river of Jordan, when you're calling the roll, remember me. Amen. And on the Lamb's book of life, I want my name wrote. I want him to remember me when the roll call. And it throws me into desperation. That is like Paul said, after I have preached the gospel, shall I be a, st a stowaway? Shall I be a, a cast off? It could happen. So it throws me into a desperate stage. Desperation. To think of after all these years of preaching. Would I, could I, a place come where I could fail him? What's the next move? What must I do next? And it throws me into a nervous stage. Now what can I do? It throws me to the mountains and to the valleys. That's hard. Because when I'm with the People, I've got to be all things to all men, that I might win some to Christ, yet with that token always before me. And I see things that's coming up, and you can't tell the people. You see different things, and you're forbidden. Then visions that they call on, and sometimes they'd be sorry if you did tell them. And you know better than to do it. And then you go so far in visions to everything becomes a vision. It throws you into a nervous stage. You, you're looking and saying, now I'm out of vision. Like right here, is this a vision? Where am I really standing at? See? You, you overwork yourself. You overtax yourself. 
and you find out things about people that you wish you didn't know. The people that desires these things to know these things, they don't realize what that type of ministry costs. You don't know what goes with it. Then it throws into desperation. Lord God, I know I'm going to have to answer. Jack Moore said to me one time, I'd hate to have to answer like you have to at the day of the judgment. Said God has put these people into your hands and you're going to give an account for every one of them. You're going to answer for your ministry. That's been about 15 years ago, or maybe 18, and since then I've been in desperation. What will I do? Let me say only what you say, Lord. Amen. Let me tell them what's the truth or don't say nothing. It throws me in desperation. Then seeing these signs coming, seeing the Holy Spirit take us out there and bring these seals and lay them in like that. Bring the church ages and lay them in. They come down in a great big pillar of fire back there and, and reveal himself. They come down on the next thing, on the seven seals, and reveal it here, put it in the papers and magazines. They come in and take the angels of God, them seven angels with seven messages, and confirm it exactly what the Bible says. Amen. Then during that time, come up and bring in those seals, those signs, flashes of the end time, and bring it up to the people and tell them what it was and all about it. And the Lord working right there, showing himself present. And then right down like this morning, come up and require that token on every person. Amen. Then you're my people. You're the ones that I love. These and them's listen to the tapes and so forth. Then you see what desperation puts me in. Amen. Desperation. Signs of His coming should throw every member of Christ into desperation. Now, about our souls, about our, our, our welfare for hereafter. Well, what are we going to amount to if we gain the whole world? What are we, what are we living for? What do you work for? What are you eating for? What are you struggling for to live? What are you living for to die? Yeah. Yeah. And you're not fit to live until you're fit to die. Right. It's true. And we see so many miracles of healing. It should put us into desperation. If that little boy... I, am I looking at Miss Peck and Paul now? Uh, is this Mrs. Peck and Paul? Uh, are you the one that had the boy here somewhere? Well, here's a woman sitting right here I was talking about. I just have to look over and see her. Now, if God can do that for that little boy, it ought to throw you into desperation. Uh, a man from New Albany, he may be here tonight, he's a friend of my brother uh, Roberson, uh, uh, had a little boy here, I think his wife had cancer once and was healed, and, and now the little boy's got asthma so bad, to, uh, he's just in bad shape. Little fella, almost cancer throat himself, see? And then uh, he brought the little boy. Yeah, I see his hand up in the back, back there. Was prayed for this morning, you see. Desperation. When the wife was about to die with cancer, he knew that God could heal her. If God could heal the wife, God can heal the boy. Amen. And it throws it into a state of desperation, see. You must come, and when you're desperate, then God's going to listen to you. Yeah. But if you just slow it, you don't care whether it does or not, well then, that's different. You say you do, but it takes desperation to do it. I believe that the reason we don't have desperation is because it's a lack of love, God, the love of God. I think that the love of God causes desperation. If God is in you, the token inside of you, and you see the conditions of times and people waiting in sin the way they are, it'll throw you into desperation. I believe it will. Now the word plainly states, if you want to put this down, in Galatians 5 and 6, that faith worketh by love. See? Faith worketh by love. And the only way that you can have faith is have love uh, first. Because after all, faith is love's incentive. Incentive, that's exactly what, what faith is. It's an incentive to love. Now, you, if you don't have love, you can't have faith. See? How can you have faith in your wife if you don't love her? That's in filial. Now, how about agapo to God? How can it be if you don't love God? 
If you said you love your wife and never tell her about it, and never sit down and make love to her, express her to her, kiss her, hug her, and tell her she's the best cook in the country, and all the things that you know and how pretty she is and how much you love her, if you don't do that, she'll never know it. That's the way, if you do love her, you express it. That's the way we do to God. When we love Him, we tell Him about it. We sit down and we adore Him and worship Him. And see, love drives us to that. Now, what if something's got to be done for your wife? Why, well, throw you into desperation to get it done. What if somebody says your wife's got cancer? What if somebody says your, your wife's got TV and she's fixing to die yet? You, you, you'll do anything. See, it'll throw you into desperation. That's the same thing that it is. We must have love before we can have faith. And faith, when we have genuine love, what does it do? It pushes our faith out on the battlefront for God. Amen. Genuine godly love for God and for His Word and for His people will push faith out there. Love just takes a hold of faith and it's, it's all let's go. Amen. And out it goes. Because that's what love does. John 14, 23, Jesus said, If a man loves me, he'll keep my words. Amen. Now, you can't keep his words without having faith in what he said. So, you see, if he loves God, then he keeps God's word. If he said, I'm the Lord, and he'll believe, he believes that. Love makes him believe it. Because love dominates all. Though I speak with tongue of man, angels have not love, it's nothing, see. Though I have faith to move mountains and have not love, it's nothing. Love dominates all because God is love. A God of love. Now, yes sir, if Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. We know it is true that God will meet a desperate soul. Uh, we all know that. But it usually takes something to drive us into that uh, to that despair, to the desperation. It takes something to do it. We find out in James 5.15 that the Bible said that the affectional, fervent, that's desperation, affectional, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen. When a righteous man, a good man, gets in travail or soul travel, or uh, travail, you know, I, I think travel is a better word. Travail or travel, you know, which one do you want to call it? But when a, a, a soul gets in, in desperation in travailing, an affectional, fervent prayer of a man that can show the token, it does something. Amen. Amen. Notice what the Bible said here also in James 16, 5, 16 says, If confessing our faults, Getting right. Making ready for it. Confess our faults one to another. Amen. Having no, no faults. Ask people to pray for you. Confessing our faults one to another and praying one for the other. Amen. There you are with love. Love that i got confidence I can confess to you my wrong. You can confess to me your wrong. Now, I love you well enough and I'll pray for you and you pray for me. And we'll stay with it with a personal, fervent prayer until it's answered. Amen. That's, that's desperation. That's what we should have all the time. Let's take some scriptural examples of that. What happened? Now for another about 15 minutes, the Lord willing. Jacob. He was a man. He was first a little kind of a carefree boy. He thought in his own mind that he knew that the birthright meant everything to him. And he didn't care how he had to get it, just so he got it. And after he got it, he thought everything was all right because he had the birthright. He thought the thing was settled. He called to his brother when he was hungry, coming in from the field, from working with the cattle and hunting the deer. And his brother he, he needed a big pot of pottage, wild peas and and things together. Might have been very tempting when a man's hungry after walking all day. And his brother said, I'm just about ready to faint. Give me some of this. And he said, well, uh, if you swear to me, I get the birthright. See? He didn't care how he'd done it, just so he got it. And he thought when he got the birthright, that's settled. 
Pentecost. That is where you failed. You thought because you were born of the Spirit. Born to the Spirit of God, the birthright, that settled it. But it only starts it. Amen. You remember in the message of, of hearing him? How that the child, after it was born, in the family become a son. It had rights to the birthright, but it had to be proven. Child trained. And then it, if it did not prove out to be a, an obedient child to the Father's will, then it must be, uh, did not get the, the was not uh, become heir. It heir nothing, yet it was a son. But he heir nothing if he wasn't interested in the Father's work. And so when the Holy Ghost fell upon the Pentecostal people and they began to restore back the gifts and things that was in the church, they thought because they were born of the Spirit, that settled it. But you see, there's a placing of a son. And after this son proved to be a real son, then he was taken to a public place and then was set up and changed robes and set up there. And then there was a placing of a son that he had and of everything the father had. God did the same thing by his son. On Mount Transfiguration, he was overshadowed by uh, the uh, cloud and was transfigured. And his raiment shined like the sun. And a voice said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Moses and the law had failed. And this is him. Here he him. He was placed. See? Now, Jacob thought because that he had the birthright that everything was made. So did the Pentecostal people, and they began to organize the, the oneness, threeness, and trinitarians, and all kinds of organizations, and fussing and pulling at one another, proved that the token wasn't shown. Amen. Malice, envy, strife, see? But that's where it got to. Now, see, Jacob thought the same thing. But in fear one night of his own life, desperation took a hold of him. What he thought... But just across that river yonder, my brother's waiting to kill me. He's going to see the birthright that he had gotten was the thing that was going to cause his death. And sometimes that very thing that you receive as the Holy Spirit, and it is, and are born again of the Spirit, if you don't watch, that same thing will condemn you at the end. That's right. The very waters that saved Noah condemned the world. The thing that, that you would call fanaticism might be the very thing that condemns you at the end of the road. Now, Jacob knew that his life was closed at the end. He had a messenger come told him that his brother with 400 armed men was coming to meet him. Notice he was on his road. Fear took a hold of him. He sent man on ahead with ox and cattle and sheep to make a peace offering with Esau. Then after that, he started another group with another load of stuff. Then he started another group with another load of stuff. Trying to meet him first to try to turn his wrath. Then he got to thinking that won't stop him because he's probably richer than I am. He doesn't need it. Then he took his wives and his little children and set them across. And Esau would see them little children and his wives and surely all his own little nieces and nephews, he would not slay them. Then he still he couldn't do it. God knows how to get a man. Jacob crossed the brook. There he got down on his knees. You know, he'd kind of been a kind of a little shyster before that. Excuse the expression, but kind of a little... He was a Jacob. Jacob needs a deceiver. And that's what he was. But there's something had to happen to him. There, in desperation. There, when death lay before him. There may be men and women sitting here tonight. That death lays right before you. And the only way that you'll ever be able to achieve the thing that you're wanting is to desperately come. I must have it tonight. I get it now or I'm finished. Tomorrow's too late. I must have it now. When you pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the token, don't say, well, I wouldn't try. Lord, uh, I'm a little tired. Oh, mercy. Stay in your seat. Don't even, don't even make an attempt. If you come say, I'll pass through the prayer line, put the oil on my head, I'll see if it does me any good. <laughs> Might as well sit where you're at. Right. Amen. Until you get to that place. Amen. Until the whole church gets to a place. Amen. 
That is between death and life. You've got to have it now to perish. Then God will move on the scene. It takes desperation to bring God on the scene. Jacob cried like never before. Desperately he called until he got a hold of God. And when he did, he wrestled not for 15 minutes. He wrestled to keep him in his soul all night long. And still, he knew he didn't have the blessing. And he was able to hold on until the blessing come. He wrestled desperately until the blessing come. Then, and when he seen, until God came on the scene, and then in despair, I'll not let you go. When he began to feel the blessing coming out on him, a lot of people say, glory to God, I got it now. There you're deceived. Yeah. Somebody said, oh, I just feel so good, Brother Bram. I went out and prayed. Oh, shivers run over me. And, uh, that that might have been God. I saw a great light before me. That still might have been God, but that ain't what I'm talking about. Amen. The Bible said in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, <clears throat> the rain falleth on the just and the unjust. Amen. Just the same. Now you take wheat and take weeds and put them in the field. And the rain is actually sent for the wheat. But the rain falls on the weeds the same as it does the wheat. And the rain is, the weeds is just as happy about the rain as the wheat is. And it's the very same rain. Amen. The very Holy Ghost can fall upon an unbeliever. And make him act just exactly the same way a believer acts. Amen. But by their fruits they are known. Amen. That's what I'm speaking of. That's a token. And they, uh, uh, Jacob, brother, in desperation, he said, I know, I feel you. You're here with me. But I'm not going to let you go. Somebody sees it fine. The personal sense, they should get, jump up, down, up, down, and say, I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, no. Mm. No. Jacob stayed there until something happened. That made him walk different. Made him a different person. Because that he stayed until that happened. And he was able, the Bible said, he held until he prevailed. How can a man prevail over God? But you can do it. You can do it. A man can prevail over God. One time there was a man named Hezekiah had been told by the prophet, Thus saith the Lord, you're going to die. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, and in desperation he wept out. Lord, consider me. I've walked before you with a perfect heart, and I need 15 more years after God had told him that something's going to happen. He's going to die. And in desperation he changed the program of God. Desperation. He wept bitterly. Desperation. Jacob stayed there until the blessing came and changed his name from a deceiver to a prince with God. Even the nation was called by his name. Yes, sir. What was it? The results was because he got desperate about the thing. And the next day when he met Esau, he didn't need any guards. <laughs> he walked right out and met him. <laughs> See? Why? He had gotten desperation until he got the assurance. And you get desperate until you get the assurance. If you don't, don't even come to be prayed for. Don't even come to go at the altar. Wait till it's between life and death to you. Then something will happen. Certainly. Desperation. Ruth got desperate one time. When she standing by Neoma. Would she have to go back to her people? To all that she loved. And all that she she worshipped her gods and her people or would she cleave to Neoma what must she do and she got in desperation and she cried out where you go I'll go where you live I'll live where you die I'll die where you're buried I'll bury it I'll be buried and your God shall be my God there you are desperate God blessed her. 
gave her a son. Obed, Obed begot Jess. Jess begot to just come Jesus. Because desperation, like the little harlot Rahab, she was desperate. She knew that death lay before her. She was under judgment. And she got desperate and said, I'll hide you, spies. I'll do anything. Only swear to your God that my house will stand. There you are. He said, oh, if you take this token, it will. Ella Ezer got desperate when a responsibility was placed upon him to haunt a bride for Isaac. Ella Ezer of Damascus was a great man. He was favored by Abraham and he was trusted by Abraham to go out and haunt a bride, a right type of a bride for his son Isaac through that would bring forth Christ. Now, Ella Ezer being a spiritual man, knowed what it meant. The right kind of a woman had to be that, that man's wife. Yes. How would he choose it? In the hour of his desperation, when he arrived at the city, he prayed and said, Lord God, Amen. that's the day when you get desperate, go to pray. Amen. Amen. Lord God. Let the first maid that comes forth and waters the camel and gives me a drink be that. He prayed in the hour of his desperation. Amen. Rebecca, the beautiful maid, came, watered the camel, and then he said, Don't delay me in my way. She had to come to a time of decision whether she would go. She was a type of the bride. Would she, would she go and marry a man who she's never even seen? Now, that's a great thing. Never even seen him. Yet you'd only heard by his servant. That's a type of the bride. You've never seen Christ. But you hear by his servants what he is. You sell out everything. Leave your homes, everything else it takes to go to find him. Now, notice. And she made the decision. The type of the bride left her denominational home. <laughs> See? To go. Jonah. Thrown overboard in a time of a storm. In the bottom of the sea, in the belly of the whale. All hopes of survival was gone. But it happened to come on his mind. That Solomon, in dedicating the temple, said, Lord, if the people be in trouble anywhere, and they'll turn towards this temple and pray then here. And turning over in the belly of the whale, managed to get somewhere to his knees, I imagine. With the bottom of the whale all over him. There he prayed in desperation. And in that desperate, just a few breaths of oxygen is all he had in the whale's belly. And in that few breaths that he was drawing, maybe he didn't know which way he was, he said, Lord, I believe I'm looking up for your Temple. And with just a few breaths to go in desperation, prayed. Under those circumstances, never been done before, but he was desperate. He prayed, and God kept him alive for three days and nights and Amen. delivered him at the place to deliver his message. Amen. Desperation. Amen. Hannah, a barren woman in the Bible, she wanted a son, and she got the fasting for him. And she fasted and prayed until even the priest at the temple thought she was drunk. She was in such desperation with the rest of the women watching what kind of a bonnet the other one had wore. You know how it goes. And the other one seeing what kind of clothes they had on and talking about the things going on on the farm. But not Hannah. She stepped right through the whole crowd and went to the altar. She'd been fasting. She wanted her reproach taken away. What a difference it is. It's almost a reproach to have a child. Amen. That it was, a, it was a reproach not to have one. And she got on her knees. And she never noticed the dignity of the temple. She never noticed a dignified priest as he walked out. She was in such distress till the tears was rolling down her cheeks and she was crying in desperation. Oh, Lord, God, give me a son. Give me a son. And notice, she wasn't selfish. When God heard her and answered her prayer and gave her a son, she gave him back to God. And because that she was willing... Not to be selfish after God had answered her prayer. He gave her a prophet. Amen. <laughs> that was an extra blessing. Oh, he's just full of them. Amen. 
those little extra things that he gave. Not only a son, but a prophet. And there had been no open vision for many, many years in Israel. Samuel, the first prophet for many, many years. Because a mother got desperate that she could have no children. And she's past the age of bearing, probably 60, 70 years old. And she prayed with desperation. She must have this child. Why is it? God had spoke to her, no doubt. You can't be desperate until God speaks to you. Oh, church, rise and shake yourself. Pinch your conscience. Wake yourself up. In this hour, we must be desperate or perish. There's coming forth something from the Lord. I know it is thus saith the Lord. There's coming forth something and we better get desperate. It's between life and death. It'll pass through us and we won't see it. Because that she wasn't selfish, she was given a prophet. The Shunammite woman had a little boy that the prophet had spoke the word of the Lord over her, though she was old and her husband old. They had no children, but she was kind to this, this prophet. And she knew that he was a man of God. She perceived that he was honorable, a real man. He come into the house, her husband not there, and whatever more, he was a holy man. They could see that he was an honorable person. She'd watched him do signs and wonders. She'd heard him tell things that happened. He was an honorable, holy man. She said to her husband, I perceive that this man that stops with us is a holy man. The lady of the house. She knew that he was a holy man. And she built a little house out there for him so he wouldn't be embarrassed. He could come by when he wanted to and so forth. She put a, a little bed out there and a, and a jug of water and so forth so he could wash himself and have something to drink. And she'd probably send a maid out or somebody to butler with, with some food to feed him and come by and bid the, the day to him or something. And so when Elijah saw this kindness done to him, and it's written, what you do to my little ones, you do it to me. So uh, she saw that the woman was honoring God as she honored this prophet, as she seen God in the prophet. And so uh, she wanted nothing for it. It wasn't her heart for anything. She just done it because she loved God. She didn't do it for any blessing. She just done it. Now, now Elijah said, go ask her, shall I speak to the king for her? I'm a personal friend. Or the chief captain, I, I know him real well. It's some favor, something I could do for her. I want to give her something for how she's been to me. She's, she's fed me. She's let me sleep in the beds, and, and she's been real nice to us. Now, what can I do? She said, no, I just roll among my people. We're, we're well off. We have a living, and that's all. We don't need nothing. And Gehazi said to him, but she doesn't have any children. No more Gehazi saw it, no doubt. The prophet saw a vision. For he said, thus saith the Lord, go tell her. In the proper time or the proper time, a year from now, she'll embrace a son. And the son was born. When he's about 12 years old, how that old couple must have loved this little boy, their only child. And one day he's out cutting wheat with his daddy. Must have been about the middle of the day. He had a sunstroke, I suppose, because he began to holler in my head. He got sicker and sicker. His daddy had to take him from the field. And it's such an emergency there that he sent a servant and sent him in. The mother held him on her lap until noontime, and he died. Notice, her only child that had been given to her by the Lord through the prayer and the promise of a prophet, and thus saith the Lord. She knew there was something wrong somewhere. It just wouldn't work. How would God give her that son and let her, her love come to that baby? Yet she never asked for it. She was too old to have it. The hand of God had to pronounce it. A man spoke at the prophet, and there this baby in this condition had died, her only son. So she said to the servant, Saddle me a mule, and you ride, and don't you stop. If anybody tries to stop me, don't you say a word. And you drive straight to Mount Carmel, up there in a cave somewhere, pull back. There's a servant of the Most High God. The one who told me, thus saith the Lord, will have the baby. I want to know why God did this. So he said, go straight forward and don't check that mule. Let him run. This is hard as everything's in him. Let him run till you get there. Desperation. Yeah. Elijah the prophet raised up. Look and said, here comes that Shunammite. 
And he said, something wrong with her. God's kept it from me. I don't know what's wrong. He said, go meet her. I got this hurry. There's something wrong. Desperation set in on the prophet. Desperation on the woman. See, they were coming together. One wanting to know what the word of the Lord was, and the other didn't know what the word of the Lord was. Here you are. One wanted to know it, the other didn't know it. The woman wanted to know it, and the prophet didn't know it. He said, God's kept it from me. I don't know what to tell her when she gets here. So she's almost there then. He raised up his hand and he said, Is all well with thee? All well with thy husband? Is all well with the child? Now the woman had reached the end of her desperation. She said, All is well. All is well. Her desperation is over. She had found the servant of the law. If he hadn't been there, she'd still been in desperation. But you see, he was there. She said, all is well. Elijah thought, well, what's going on now? So she ran up and fell down at his feet. That looked kind of uncommon. So Gehazi just lifted her up. He said, let her alone. Don't do that. Elijah said to his servant, don't do that. Let her alone. There's something wrong. God keeps it from him. Then she revealed to him that the baby was dead. Now the prophet didn't know what to do. He said, Gehazi, take this staff that I've walked on. He knew that whatever he touched was blessed. Because it wasn't him, it was God in him. He knew who he was. He knew that he was a prophet. So he picks up this staff and said, Gehazi, you take this and you go and lay it upon the child. And if anybody speaks to you, you get desperate. <laughs> And don't you sleep nobody and let no, just keep going on. Don't speak to nobody. Put it up on the child. But the woman, that didn't end her desperation. That didn't satisfy what she come for. She said, as the Lord God lives, I'm, I'm not going to leave you until you go minister to the child. And Elijah got desperate. And here he went, down the road, him and the woman. And when they got there, the, all the people were out in the yard screaming and crying. And the woman had done the most appropriate thing could be done. She tucked the baby and laid him on the bed where Elijah had laid him. Yeah, that was as good as the staff. And he didn't wake up there so the thing wouldn't work. <laughs> she wanted to know something different. The prophet went in. Now he's in desperation. Now what's he going to do? And we find in the Bible that he walked up and down the floor. <laughs> Desperate. I don't know nothing else to do, Lord. Here I am. You told me to speak that to that woman, and thus saith the Lord, and it's exactly the way I told her, because you told me. Now, there she's in trouble, and I don't know what to do. There lays a dead boy. What can I do, Lord? No doubt the Holy Spirit said, if the God is in you, then lay yourself on the baby. First thing you know, he stopped. Run, put his hands upon his hands. His nose upon his nose. His lips upon its lips. And when he laid his step forward, the baby sneezed seven times. Amen. Desperation was over. Amen. The baby comes to life. Because the desperation drove the woman to the prophet and desperation drove the prophet to the baby. Amen. And desperation, both of them drove God on the scene. Amen. With love of God and love for his people brought the love of God down and threw faith out on the battlefront and the work was done. Amen. Days closed. Amen. That's it. Desperation does it. Certainly. She wasn't going to leave. Blind by mess. Thought Jesus was going to pass him by. Sitting out there at the gate. Blind. Beggar for alms. The first thing you know, it heard a noise. Jesus is passing by. He said, who passes by? Somebody shoved him down. He said, please, somebody, who's passing by? One of them, maybe a kind little disciple woman, said to him, said, sir, don't you know who that is passing by? No, I hear some of them say there's a whole graveyard full of dead people up here. If you raise the dead, go raise them. Is it a blasphemer or somebody? No. Have you ever heard of that prophet of Galilee, that young prophet called Jesus of Nazareth? No. Well, you know, in the Bible it says, in our scrolls, that the son of David will be raised up to sin. That's him. Is that him? Is that him? And he's passing by. Amen. Desperation drove him to scream, 
Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Amen. Pass me, not, O oh, gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others are calling, do not pass me by. Amen. Oh, Jesus, some of them said, shut up. You make too much noise. But he was desperate. If he got by, he might never have another opportunity. We might not either. This might be the last night. Desperation, he screamed out. Oh, Jesus. No matter who told him to stop, he cried just the same. That much more louder. When they told him to shut up, it made him get louder. He was desperate. Nobody could stop him. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he screamed in desperation. And the son of God, with the sins of the world upon his shoulders, going to Jerusalem to be offered up right then for a sacrifice for the world, stopped in his tracks. Desperation. A despairing cry stopped the son of God. He said, what would you have me do for him? Oh, Said, so, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Said, so, go your way, your faith saves you. Amen. That was enough. Desperation. When desperation is to receive something, the faintest little touch, faith grabs it. Amen. See? He didn't say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, just a minute, let me see if I can see now. I've never seen my hands for many years. Let's see if I can see it. I don't see nothing yet. When Jesus said, Thy faith has saved thee, that was enough. And that's all he wanted. Desperation calls for a subject. And when the subject, no matter how faint it is, it's received, it's believed right there because faith catches when desperation is pushing it. Amen. See? Love in there mixes with it and brings it to it. Desperation does. Blind Barnabas caught the vision quickly. Peter is all steamed up one night on the sea when he got in desperation. And he began to cry out, there's something wrong. I see a spirit come walking to me. The ship was about to go down. He said, if it be you, Lord, bid me come to you on the water. And he stepped down out of the ship and started. And he got scared when he got started. And he started to sink in desperation. Though a mistake in trying to follow the commandments of God. And I hope the church gets that. The man was doing what God told him to do. Amen. Now you Christians tonight, you're in the line of duty trying to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And a cancer grabs you. Or a, a death grabs you. The cancer, too much, or whatever it is. In the line of duty, you have the same right that Peter had. Lord, save me or I'll perish. Amen. In desperation, he called out and a hand reached and picked him up. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have the same name. But he screamed out, Save me, Lord. Amen. He heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me and I was safe. Am I? See, pray. Oh, that's it. When you cry out, maybe this woman, mother, whatever it was to her little son or grandson or nephew or whatever it was, cried out in despair. God heard. Then, we find out that in the sinking, God heard him. In the line of duty, he started to sink. He failed. No matter if you fail, that don't have nothing to do with it. We all fail. We're a failure to begin with. But we got somebody standing down with a strong hand who can reach us and take us above the water. If you made a mistake, some woman made a mistake, some man made a mistake, some boy, girl made a mistake, don't sink. Scream out. In despair, Lord, save me or I'll perish. Get desperate about it. God will hear you. He always hears a desperate soul. That's what I'm trying to tell you about. Hallelujah. Our dear Lord, Jesus himself, in the world's greatest battleground, Gethsemane, he cried out in despair. Should he take the sins of the world? Or should he just remain on earth with his beloved disciples, what he wanted to do? But what's his humility as he humbled himself? Not my will, but thine be done. Humble himself to the word, the promised word of the God of heaven. Notice, then he went a little further. And if he went a little further, 
How much more ought we to go a little farther? Yeah. And notice, the scripture says here in Luke that he prayed earnestly. Brother and sister, if Amen. Jesus had to pray earnestly, how much more have we got to pray earnestly? Amen. If Christ, the God of heaven, made flesh, had to pray earnestly, then how much more are we, sinners saved by grace, pray earnestly? If, if the decision throw the Son of God into despair, what will it do to you and I? Desperately, we must cry. God in these last days has manifested Himself so to us by His great signs and power should make us desperate. That's right. And is willing to heal us and save us or to throw us all into desperation to get to that healing stone. That's right. Look, if Florence Nightingale, the great granddaughter of the late Florence Nightingale that founded the Red Cross, you see her picture in the book, weighed about 30 pounds. Cancer would eat her up in London, England. They brought her from Africa. London, England. And there, in despair, Brother Biles wrote back and told her, said, we can't come to Africa. She stroked back, had a nurse to write and said, I can't be moved. I can't do it. Showed the picture. You've seen the picture. Amen. Only we had to put a little piece over it. It just had a small cord around. I thought maybe somebody put in the book might criticize because she was, her body was so exposed. There. And we put a little thing across her here. She just had a, a little a rag a towel laying across, across her hips. But up above, there was nothing, and even, but we thought we put a little piece of paper on there and photographed the photograph back to keep people who's not got the right kind of a position in their mind of thinking that they wouldn't criticize me putting that picture in the paper. And then, when the doctor said that she can't be moved, and she knew I was going to visit England, she had them to put her on a stretcher and pack her to a plane. And bring her to London, England, and send a guard out to the plane before going down to Buckingham Palace, send a guard out there to come pray for her. And she was so far gone until she couldn't even speak to me. They had to raise her hands to put it in mind. You know how London is, some of these soldiers been there, it's always so foggy. And I knelt down there by the side of a window. And she, the tears are running off. She wanted to, I don't know how she even got enough moisture to let tears come. It's just only bone, skin over. And her, her legs up here at the hips wasn't over about, looked to me like about two inches across or three inches. Her veins was collapsed. How she's living, I don't know. You've seen her picture later. I knelt down by the side of the bed. Now she was desperate. Whether I could come or not, they're going to bring her anyhow. And I got down there. My heart was bleeding within me. Uh, the faith of that poor little dying creature. And I prayed with all the heart that I had. And while I started to pray, a little turtle dove come through on the window. Began to walk up and down cooing. I thought it was a pet. I hadn't been in England about an hour just coming from the airport down there. And I thought it was a pet. And when I raised up and said, Amen, it flew away. And I started to ask the brethren, did they hear that dove? And they were talking about it. And when I started to say, did you see what that dove means? It come out, thus saith the Lord. You'll live and not die. And she's living today. Why? Desperation. Amen. Desperation drove the woman to take a stand. Live or die. Desperation. A race that she got there at the same time I did. And a token from God, he sent a dove to give thus. Amen. 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 Desperate. When Sister O'Hattie Waldorf of Phoenix, Arizona, she's coming up the sidewalk in my first meeting. The intern and her husband's bring her cancer of the heart. She had made her stand to try to get there to the meeting. But... She was so bad, she was, couldn't breathe no more. The blood is dropping back to her heart. Well, the cancer would eat into her heart. Now, cancer of the heart. That's about 18, 19 years ago. Maybe 20. 
1947 is when it was. Now, she said to her husband and the intern, If though I die in this life, take me up there. Desperation. She lost consciousness. I don't think she was dead. She claimed she was. Now, she might have been. She may hear this tape this evening. Now, I, 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 she, she claimed she was dead. I don't know. They told me she's a dead woman coming up the line. And when the woman come by, she was lifeless. And when they brought her up there, the word of the Lord came. And I went and laid hands upon her, and she rose up and went home walking. Amen. This has been about, I'd say, safely 18 years ago. And she's just as healthy and hearty. She'll be at Tucson to meet me when I get down there. Amen. Desperation. Though I die in the road, still we get me down there. Amen. He healed others. He'll heal me. Willing. Let our hearts be filled with love in this day. And be earnest in a desperation. After a while, it may be too late. Jarius one time had a little daughter that was dying. He was a borderline believer. He believed Jesus, but he's afraid to confess it because they put him out of the synagogue. But the doctor come one morning and says, she's dying now. Desperation set in. He couldn't afford as his position to be caught with Jesus of Nazareth because he'd lose his position as a priest. But I'll tell you, when an emergency come and throw him to desperation... I can see him hunting for his little preacher's coat and hat and slipped it on. Here he come down through the crowd pressing around where there's a woman just touched his garment and so forth. And there's a whole shout, but he went in and said, Master, my little girl's laying at the point of death. Master, Master, my little girl's laying at the point of death. And if you just come lay your hands on her, she'll live. Oh, my. Yeah. Desperation makes you say things sometimes. Makes you do things. It puts you to action. His daughter was saved by the desperation. Let's be desperate like that little woman with the blood issue. The Bible said she'd spent all of her money with the physicians, and yet they couldn't help her. She started time of menopause to flooding and a blood issue, and it wouldn't stop. They'd, maybe it sold the farm, the mules, the horses, and whatever it was, and nothing could help her. And their priest had told her never to go around such as that. But one morning she looked down, she lived up on the bank up there where a farm was. She seen a great bunch of people gathering around a man down there and they said, What is that? So that's Jesus of Nazareth. Desperation set in. She said, I'm kind of insignificant. I, I, but if I can only touch the border of his garment, I'll be made well. Hallelujah. And she passed by every critic and everything else. But then she got to the spot. She touched his garment in desperation. And when he did, he turned and said, who touched me? And they all denied it. But he looked around. He was possessed with a great gift of God. He was God. And he found the little woman and told her her blessed issue had stopped. Desperation drove her to do that. It was desperation. It drove the queen of the south. She heard that the gift of God was working through Solomon. Desperation drove her to that. Desperation. That's human beings, like you, like me. They wasn't any different from you and I. They had five senses to eat and drink and so forth like we do, live and die. They were human beings. It drove her into such desperation until she took part of her kingdom. It drove her to a place that she didn't think about, that Ishmaelites would rob her on the desert. Her 90 days on the back of a camel across the Sahara Desert. Desperation, she's going anyhow. And when she got there, there was nothing help from Solomon but what he told her, the things that she wanted to know. Desperation, Jesus said she'll rise in the day of the judgment with this generation condemning. Because they're greater than Solomon this year. Desperation. In closing, I might say this. Not long ago down in Mexico, I seen something desperate. I just got to the platform there in a big arena. And people have been in there since 9 o'clock that morning. It was nearly 10 o'clock that night. An old blind man, the night before, totally blind for about 30 years, received his sight. He was going around the city that day testifying. An old rick of clothes laying for maybe 30, 40 yards that high. This old shawls is maybe 40, 50,000 people there. And old hats and shawls, who they belong to, I guess they have to 
beside that among them. They're pouring down rain. And they let me down a rope over a wall. And I got on the platform. The, minister, the man that sat here that brought his, him and his daughter come down from Michigan a few minutes ago. Talked about Brother Ahmed. We remember him here. He's on the streets of glory tonight. Brother Ahmed was there and took his overcoat off and stood in the rain and gave it to Brother Jack Moore to put on because Jack was shivering the southerners about to freeze in that cold rain there in Mexico. And there he was standing there. And Brother Paul come to me, my son, and said, Daddy, you'll have to do something. There's a little Mexican woman down there with a dead baby that died this morning. I ain't got enough ushers to hold her out of the line. <laughs> if laying hands on that blind man, give him his sight. Laying hands on her dead baby, but give it a sign. She was a Catholic. And she, they couldn't hold her back. And Brother Espinosa Slam had told her that we have no more prayer cards. You'll have to wait till another night. She said, my baby's dead. It's been dead since this morning. I must get in there. And she was coming prayer card or not. And they lined up about 300 ushers there. And she'd go right under their legs and jump up on top of their backs and run with this dead baby and fall down among them. It make any difference to her. She's trying to get there. She was desperate. God had spoke to her heart that the God could give sight, could give life. Oh, my. She was desperate. Something was burning in her. Oh, sick people, you let that burn in you for a few minutes. Watch what happens. That kind of a desperation. The God that could heal... This little boy the other night could heal that day cancer, heal this man, do this, this far sight, get all the tens of thousands. He, that undisputable evidence, raising the dead and healing the sick and everything else. If he's God can do that, he's God yesterday, he's God today. Get desperate. Then you'll get something done. Then in that desperation, she kept rushing. I said to Brother Jack Moore, I said, she don't know me. She's never seen me. She don't know who it is up here on the platform. That little Catholic woman not, couldn't speak a word of English. Son. How does she know who it is? I said, go on down, pray for the baby, and that'll satisfy her, and she'll go on. I said, and they won't call. It's just constant roar down there. She'd jump up, and everybody be screaming. She'd run all the top of her shoulders and fall right down among them. She'd gain a few feet, and then they'd try to put her back out, and here she'd come out between her legs, holding this baby, upsetting the ushers and everything else. they make making her, she's getting up there. She had to get there. It don't make a difference what it was. She was going to get there. Had to minister. Now, isn't that just a story like the Shumanite woman? Yeah. Only that wasn't 3,500 years ago. That was about three years ago. Before. See? They can be the same thing tonight. When the same desperation rises, I'll throw love and faith up there to the battlefront to claim what you want. Amen. Because it's a promise of God that you can have it. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. I turn. Me, the minister, uh, uh, the evangelist at, at the place. I turned. I felt sorry for the woman, but there's no desperation. See? I turned and thought, well, your brother Jack will pray for her. That, that settles it. I turned. I said, as I was speaking, my faith, I looked out there and there was a vision. I seen a little baby, a little black-faced Mexican baby with no teeth. It was laughing at me. Sitting out there, I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Her desperation drove the Holy Spirit to change my subject, change my life, show me her baby sitting there. That sent the Spirit back. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bring me the baby. Here she comes with a little wet, soaking, blue and white blanket, a little dead form about that long. She fell with a crucifix in her hand or a rosary to say these Hail Marys. I told her, put it up. That's not necessary. And she come up close to where I was, and she screamed, her Padre, which means Father. I said, don't say that. Don't say that. Do you believe? And he said it in Spanish to her. Did she believe? Yes, she believed. He asked her, how would she believe? She said, if God can give that old man his sight, he can give my baby the life. Amen! Amen. Desperation drove her to it. Not a thing on my part. I just saw the vision. I said, Lord Jesus... I saw a vision of a little baby. It might be this one. About that time, he kicked his feet. Went whack, whack, whack. I said, follow her to the doctor. Get a written statement from the doctor. That baby died. And the doctor wrote the statement. That baby's respiration, heart stopped this morning in my office at 9 o'clock. Died with double pneumonia. Oh, the babies are living in Mexico tonight as far as I know. Why? Ah! The desperation set in our little mother's heart, crying for her child that had seen God do 
heal a man's blind eyes and know he could raise a dead baby. Desperation. When thou seekest me with all thy heart, then I hear you. See? The kingdom, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the kingdom of heaven's been preached and man pressed into it. Hallelujah. You don't just stand off and say, pick me up with the collar, Lord, push me in. You press into it. Amen. You get desperate. Amen. Between life and death. Wish I had time for another story. But I was thinking right now of a woman, a girl, took a wrong road. And how she turned new pages and things. But I said, Sister, she got up and said, I, I believe I'll be all right. I said, No, no. Stay there. And then, first thing you know, she started praying a little bit. And directly, she got louder and louder. After a while, she got desperate. So, oh, God, save me. Alcohol, synonymous, couldn't cure it. Nothing else could do it. But that big black eyes looked at me and the tears dropped over her cheeks. She said, something's happened. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Something happened. She got desperate. Amen. Let's be desperate about this. Amen. Between death and life. Amen. If you can't get desperate, don't come through here. If you are desperate, come here and watch. You, you'll get it as soon as you get here. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Thank you. In desperation, watch for the kingdom of God. It'll come upon you. Our Heavenly Father, I pray thee in Jesus' name, be merciful unto us, Lord. Yes. Start in us a desperation. O oh Lord God, have mercy upon us, I pray. Let the people seek thee tonight with desperate hearts. We know you're here, Lord. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now, may these people who has the token that they pass from death unto life, they've changed from the old worldly life to a new one. They have, the blood has been applied, and God give them a token sign. May they take that token in their hands. Damn it, sick. Say, I am a purchased product of God. I am in Christ, and in Him is no sickness. I am in Christ, and in Him is no sin. I am in Christ, and in Him is no unbelief. I renounce everything that the devil has told me. I take my token that my he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace is upon him, and with his stripes I was healed. And I now hold the token that God has recognized me, that per purpose, perfect person, purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And I hold the token of his death in my hands because he has raised again. And I am his and he's mine. I go with determined faith that from this night on, I believe God. And I'll be healed when I get there and meet the requirements because the last words that fell from his lips was this. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Uh, Grant it, Lord. May a desperation set in for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I can, I will, I do believe. Can, I will, I do believe. I can, I will, I do that Jesus heals me now. Oh, I can, I will, I do believe. I can, I will, I do believe. Just think I'm determined. I can, I will, I do believe that Jesus heals me now. You believe that? I'm determined. I'm determined by the grace of God. That I'll never stop until that something strikes me. And I'm going up there to have hands laid on me. Now God has never failed us. Now I believe the great physician now is near. I believe the God that wrote the word. I believe the God that made the sacrifice. I believe the token of the God that cleanses us from sin tonight. The token his own life is here with us. I'll be with you even to the end of the world. Amen. A little while the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me. For I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. You believe that? Amen. I'm trusting in him.
I believe that he will do it. Don't you? Amen. Now, as soon as I start that, I see visions appearing. Amen. Great visions of the Lord. Speaking great things. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. If I start that, we'll be here all night. <laughs> Go to believe it. You believe? Amen. Amen. I believe it with all my heart. The little lady sitting out there from Brother Palmer. She's a stranger to me. She is from Georgia and she's suffering with a female trouble. But she believes that God will make her well. He'll do it. I've never seen a woman in my life, but that's what's the matter with her. That little woman, I don't know if she ever heard the message before or not, but while I was preaching here, I saw her. You just believe it and see if that's right. Amen. If you'll only believe, that's right. The lady sitting right back here with back trouble, suffering real bad. Her name's Miss Wisdom. If you'll believe with all your heart, Jesus Christ will make you well. I've never seen a woman in my life. But she's sitting there suffering. She's wearing a yellow dress. Is that right? Or are we strangers to one another? Yes. All right, sir. You go home, be well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Uh, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another woman has just caught that back trouble sitting over here. She's got back trouble. She's got a boy and he's got head trouble. <laughs> That's right. Mrs. Parker is her name. Amen. And if you believe with all your heart in Jesus Christ, he'll heal you both. Amen. You're strangers to me. That's exactly right. Amen. Believe with all your heart. Here's an elderly man sat back here from Michigan. He's having trouble in his ears. Or he thinks voice is spiritual trouble. Is that right? You're believing that, that you don't know where God or what is talking to you. You hear noises in your ears. I'm a total stranger to you. If that's right, raise up your hands. And that's what's taking place. It'll never bother you no more. Jesus Christ. Hey, 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 hey. Do you believe? Hey, hey, hey. The great physician. I'd speak to you about from Norway and you don't understand Norwegian language. Uh, all right, tell him to go home believing. Sister, if you know how to speak it, tell him his head trouble of leaving. <laughs> now, you know I don't know him. He's come here from Norway to be prayed for. Go back to well now. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. What is it? It's that pillar of power. It's that holy Jesus Christ lives. And when people long ago saw him do those things, he perceived their thought because he is the word and the word is sharper than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. I see him water flashing and this young lad coming. He heard and read a book over there and wrote Norwegian. He got to understanding. Somebody spoke to him. He's having trouble, but if he'll believe with all his heart, the Lord Jesus is going to make him well. He's come a long way to the poor kid at that. Trying to press in. We'll lay hands on him in a minute. Do you believe? Amen. Amen. How wonderful. Oh, my. The great physician now is here. Sister, where is that sister Ungren at? And that other sister at the piano. I want you to come right quickly if you will, and give us a song. That great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. Uh, I want the people that's on this aisle here that wants to be prayed for, kindly come down on this side here, just one aisle at a time. Brother Neville, you do that if you will. Where's Brother Caps or one of those song leaders? How about Brother Ungren or Brother Caps or somebody? Come here, old saint, lead this song for us if you will. Because Brother... Where is one of those brothers at? So, oh, all right, sir. That's good. All right. Everybody in prayer. Remember, desperation. See what desperation will do? Desperation will drive you across the sea. Desperation will drive you from another state. Desperation will drive you anywhere. A precious old father and his daughter with desperation tried to get in, come in, everything else, and set out anyhow. A few moments ago, the Holy Spirit delivered the thing here at the meeting. Just for God in here. Oh, the sweetest carol ever sung. Jesus, blessed Jesus. Let those who are desperate now that really know that you're going 
mistake, as far as I know, 100% left from last Sunday night. Got well this week. The symbolize. Watch, he comes. See, he's already healed you. He brings his word. He confirms it. He shows his presence. Nobody can do those things outside of God. You know that. It's a sign of the Messiah. And you know I'm no Messiah. So it's him. Yeah. Now here he's proved everything to you. Now it ought to throw you into desperation. Yeah. It ought to electrify this place. And touch a, it'll just be like a, 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 a match to a bell of powder. Certainly, it ought to explode the faith and, and love and desperation driving people right into the kingdom of God to believe with all their heart. Do you believe now, every one of you? Yeah. All right. Now, Billy, you will get the... Tony, look here at me a minute. I haven't seen you for a long time, but you're sick. You're suffering with something like a dysentery. That's right. It's going to quit. It's going to leave. Amen. Amen. I've seen that thing following him. She started through there. There is a thing to be hid from God right now. I've never seen, I haven't seen Tony for months, I guess. But I see he's having that. He did have it. Hey, hallelujah. Yes, he did. That's by our heads. Not one eye to be open. Not one eye to look. Let's everybody be in prayer. And Billy Paul or Brother Neville one will call the next rose when it comes time. Now everybody in prayer. We're going to try now. The middle aisle will come to your left hand side when you're called. And so will the, the left hand aisle over here come to your left hand side when you're called. Brother Neville will call you. Now I wonder if there is any of the brethren here that would like to stand here to lay hands on these people as you come by with me. And you minister brothers, you're certainly welcome to come and stand with me if you want to do it. It's not an isolated thing. You have rights to pray for the sick the same as I. I know the Holy Ghost is here. Anybody wouldn't believe that, there's something wrong with me. All right? Let's believe now with all of our hearts that God will grant these things that we're asking. Have faith now. Don't doubt. And everybody pray one for the other. What the Bible say? Confess our faults one to another. Pray one for the other. And you people coming in the line, as soon as these hands touch you, you go right out of here just happy and praising God that you're here. Lord, everybody in prayer. Now, what Brother Cap says is all. Lord Jesus, now help us. I pray through Jesus Christ's name that the Holy Ghost will touch each person and may they be healed. As we follow your commandments for laying hands on the sick, you said they shall recover. We believe it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right? Everybody in prayer now as we start praying. First is a little sick boy.
this week and when you come back again watch what's happened Amen. I suppose for the next time I get back to the Lord willing I'll be running a prayer line through one of these rooms in that little room that I'm to take them to you see I believe it's unfolding now you see the hour I want to come to where I can bring the people one at a time deal individually with them until I search it out and find it and then go ahead like that until I stay right with them at that time God bless you all we're so happy you were here have you got, are you persistent now? Do you, are you in desperation? Your desperation that you had for your healing has it all ceased now in a love and faith and confidence that God will do what He promised tonight. God will do. From them, little children, there's two or three of them here tonight in wheelchairs. Uh, we'll believe for them. They're children. That they're going to be healed too. They're going to be well. Don't you believe it? They, they will recover. they got to do it. God said so. And we're desperate and they're going to believe it now and it'll be done. Now, our services just involve one thing right after the other. Now, we're going to dismiss the audience to those who have to go. And best I can see, it's about 8 minutes until 10 o'clock. And if you have to go, we're, we're happy you were here. And we want you to come back and be with us. The rest of you, after we stand, will be seated again. And those who are going, go just quietly as possible. And then we're going to have the communion service immediately after that. You're invited to stay if you can. If you can't, God bless you. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. And remember, keep the token applied and be desperate to press to the kingdom of God. Amen. Now we're going to sing our dismissing song, if we can, and uh, take the name of Jesus with you as we stand. Name of Jesus with you, child. Bless you, my pilgrim brother, sister. 
deeply, sincerely, reverently, and Christian friends and ties of fellowship, shake one another's hands, brother and sister. God bless you all together. Wonderful. I love you. of the great token of God, the Holy Ghost, may He richly abide with you all until we meet again. God's grace go with you, smite death's ways before you, making your path clear that you might see Jesus always before your face, and you shall not be moved. My Heavenly Father, we commit this service and the service this morning those services and what's been done and all glory to Thee, giving Thee thanks and praise for saving people and for healing the people and for giving us Thy great grace that we all look to save us. How we thank You for this. Be with us now until we meet again. Meet with us in the communion. Be upon the wheel of those who drive, Lord, to their homes. Guide them through these reckless holidays and no harm and danger may come to them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that. Amen. Amen. Mark, take the name of Jesus with you again. <laughs> take the name of Jesus. You're dismissed now. Amen. With you as a shield from every stair. Quieting now for the communion service. 
If I'm not mistaken, isn't this Brother Blair the minister that I met over in Arkansas not long ago? I thought it was. I wasn't sure. You had up here for a dedication of child, a little one this morning. I thought, didn't I meet you not long ago here at uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas? With, you was, uh, something was about to happen, and the Holy Spirit called it out. Was that right? Good. <laughs> I just, uh, I have to think back then. I thought, that's that, brother. I'm so glad you're here, Brother Blair. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Blair if he'll pray for God to make us uh, clean now for the communion that's fixing to take place. Will you, Brother Blair? Our great Creator, we look unto you this night, thanking you that you have been among us. Yes. How yes. great thou art, Lord. Yes, Lord. My every thought tonight as the great writer wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brought into subjection to the Almighty right now. Grant it, Lord. Yes. Lord, might we be purified and cleansed by the King of your blood. Yes, Lord. O oh, Heavenly Father. Father, as we partake of this communion service now, let it be with the right attitude. Yes, Lord. Oh, Father, knowing that your body was broken for us. Yes, Lord. And your blood was shed for us. Yes, and, Father, it's by faith in that today. It's by faith in the institution of the Lord's Supper in this hour. We fully believe, Lord, Amen. in this yes. great thing. Grant it tonight, our Father, together in unity we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated now, each one. And now, on the organ, sister, we always pay that each account. And you can start your head in there, whatever it is. All right. The reading now would just be, get quiet just for a moment. Yes, sister. All right, sister. You just look through here till you find it. Honey. All right. Whatever it is. I, that's it. All right, sister. All right. Now, Brother Neville will read the order of the communion. And then the ushers will be coming if the strangers here to each seat and bring in aisle by aisle as we come in row by row for the communion. And now, may you meditate now. Remember... Israel eat it in desperation and through the journey there wasn't a feeble one among them in the end of 40 years. This is divine healing also. Lord bless you, Brother Him. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take Eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the word. The Lord bless the reading of his word. My whole kosher bread, wrinkled and broken, Representing the body of Jesus Christ through, through this riven veil, we have access to the Holy of Holies. Our Heavenly Father, this bread has been prepared to represent that broken and torn body. May each of us, as we receive it, may it be as though we literally had did this act. May we have the forgiveness of our sins and the access to the Holy of Holies to live in your presence in our future life. And all the days that we shall live here on earth and be with you in eternity forever. Grant it, Father. Bless this bread for that intended purpose. In Jesus' name, amen.
the Bible said after he had taken and broke the bread, like manner he took the cup, and when he stopped saying, This is the cup of the New Testament, my blood, which is shed for you. May the Lord grant his blessings upon this as we pray. Lord Jesus, I hold here the blood of the vine, the juice from the grape. And Father, it's to represent that precious blood that cleanses us, that from there came the token. I thank thee for it, Father. And for this symbol, you said, He that eats and drinks this has everlasting life, and I'll raise him up again at the end time. We thank thee for this promise. And Father, we pray that you cleanse our hearts together, that we will be worthy by the, our faith, knowing that in ourselves we are not worthy, but our faith will not fail, that we are accepting perfectly the blood of Jesus Christ. Grant it, Father, and sanctify the wine for its intended purpose. May whosoever drinks this wine tonight and takes of this bread have strength for the journey that lays ahead. Grant it, Lord. May they be healthy and strong and filled with your spirit till Jesus comes. Amen. I believe that communion is one of the most solemn, sacred, sweetest worships there is in the church service. There was two things left, the three things to do that as orders and ordinances so many people try to say we got an original nail, we got a piece of the cross, but there were three things left: Lord's Supper, baptism, feet washing. Well, it's the three orders that was left to the church. And it, tonight seemed to be a very special time for me, as I stood here and just watching. Usually, I I'm constantly in prayer, but tonight watching the different families. To see some of them families has come here since I was a boy, preacher, stand here with sawdust floors. And I, some of them are new. But watching the man come with their little wives and family and see how they prefer one another and the sacredness of that, how they watch their children, see the little lady and her hands reach out and think that little hands washed and wipe the tears in the baby's eyes. Then I'll seen the families come up that I've been in their homes when they were sick and the fever children the Lord Jesus make their children well I see them when they had family trouble the Lord helped me to get it smoothed out see them happy again and I just think hard would be when we go to that great wedding supper I'm so thankful that the Lord has let me be a friend to you and help you uh, that's what I'm here for and I just think how long, how many years, this is about, I started preaching about 1930, and this is about 32 years for me now, 33 years I've been preaching. And all the struggles and trials, and it looks like, oh, when, when we come up here, it, it's all for God. You, you just seem like it's something about communion, it just takes all, all the twist out of things, taking the communion. Lord bless you. The elder now is going to read the scripture for the people are certain. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. 
for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. As many as will partake, the man will wash feet in this room over here, and the ladies will wash feet in the room to the left over here, in the little baptistry room. I'm mighty happy to see as many as would like to and can to come and participate with us in this foot washing. Shall we stand again? To those who must go, Again, we say we are really thankful and appreciative before God for this good day that has been such an encouragement to our heart in seeing the great and mighty presence of our God to come into our midst, to be here to encourage us and to bless us. To so bow our heads together, we'll ask Brother Earl Martin if he'll dismiss the ones that needs must go.